Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation, which, like other think tanks, has been in virtual mode since the beginning of the coronavirus crisis. Um, we have been trying to look at the same sorts of issues as we were looking at in the real world, uh, with some success. We've had uh, about 50 or 60 little mini videos and webinars put up on our website. But one of the most serious issues and one of the issues that we've got best response on is the general geopolitical situation in which we all find ourselves. And I'm delighted that our guest today is Professor Steve Walt, uh, who is Professor of International Affairs at the Kennedy School at Harvard. He's the Rene and uh, Robert Belfort Professor. Uh, he, is, uh, he taught at uh, Princeton and at Chicago. His PhD is from Berkeley. And he's the author of a number of very important articles and books amongst the books that he is responsible for was a highly controversial book called The in in Israel Lobby, which you co-wrote with John Mearsheimer from, uh, from Chicago. More recently, he has uh, published a book on the uh, the Hell of Good Intentions, America's Foreign Policy Elite and the Decline of U.S. Primacy, which he published in 2018. He's what's broadly known in the trade as a realist, a critic, at least if he's a, not entirely a realist, he's a critic of military adventurism. He has views on the Biden presidency, on Israel, on Iran, on Russia, on China, but in a way, most interesting of all is his critique of what he has called the blob. And the blob is the conventional wisdom on foreign relations, foreign policy in the US. Most recently, he's been tweeting on a conference that he uh, was invited to at Johns Hopkins, uh, which seems to have been de designed as a broad brush look at various options in foreign policy, but was really just a meeting of members of the blob members of the blob, many of his own, his colleagues at the Kennedy School, uh, really have, uh, they are liberal, they're interventionist, many of them are neocons and they represent a foreign policy consensus that he believes that he does not. It's, he's a very interesting thinker. I've listened to Steve for several years now and he's never said anything that I disagree with. So I give you Professor Steve Walt. Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, recording this for uh, your colleagues. Um, so I'm gonna talk at some length about the global order that we're moving into, and in particular talk about the impact of COVID-19 on how that's likely to shape uh, the future of the global order. Um, and I'll say a few words at the end about what areas uh, we still need to be focusing on in terms of cooperation, uh, but the story I'm gonna tell is not a particularly cheerful one. So here's the outline. I'm going to uh, first by, begin by summarizing my main arguments uh, and then uh, talk about some of the trends that were taking place in the world before the pandemic hit, before COVID-19 was even known about. Uh, I'll then summarize the direct impact of the pandemic. That should be pretty familiar to everyone. Um, and then lay out what I think the principal results are going to be. And you can see them there. I think we're heading towards a world that is much less open than the one we were in beforehand, uh, and also a world that is less free, uh, where individual freedom is gonna be restricted in ways that it wasn't before. I think, again, those are trends that were taking place before the pandemic, but the pandemic will accelerate them. Uh, and then I'll summarize uh, by talking a little bit about the future global order we're headed into and what its main features are likely to be. So here are my main arguments. Uh, first of all, uh, COVID-19 is not going to alter the basic nature of global politics. Uh, we are not going to see a vast increase in global governance. We're not going to see the formation of a world state or anything like that. Uh, the territorial state, the nation state, is going to remain the basic building block of world politics. Those countries, and particularly the great powers, will continue to compete for power and influence. Now, that doesn't mean that multinational corporations, financial institutions, transnational organizations, international organizations, and all sorts of other actors are completely irrelevant. Uh, I'm just suggesting here that the atmosphere or the environment of global politics will still be primarily determined by states and within that primarily by the great powers. I'll say a little bit more about that at the end. 
the pandemic, of course, is not irrelevant here. It's going to accelerate several trends that were already underway before it began. And in fact, I think make many of those trends uh, substantially worse than they would have been. Uh, specifically, COVID-19 is reinforcing the gradual shift in power uh, away from Europe and the West toward Asia. And it's going to lead to a world that is less open and less free than it would have been otherwise. Let me say a little bit about why that's happening. Um, so here are what these trends were before COVID-19 uh, struck. Uh, first, we were seeing the end of the unipolar era, the era where the United States was really uh, almost unchallenged on the world stage, was actively trying to shape world politics in lots of different places, and in particular, trying to spread a set of liberal values far and wide uh, with some optimism that it was going to be able to do that. Uh, we're heading rather uh, into a world where those values are not going to be uh, universally embraced and where you're going to see growing great power competition, uh, primarily between the United States and China, uh, but also uh, between the United States and Russia with some other powers, India, Germany, and some others uh, playing roles as well. Um, that was happening, again, before uh, COVID-19 hit. We were already seeing, I think, the reemergence of a multipolar, admittedly lopsided, but multipolar world. Um, second, as part of that, we're seeing a gradual shift in power and wealth from West to East. I don't want to uh, overstate this. I'm not suggesting that the West is now weaker, say, than China or Asia, only that the trend lines are uh, for greater economic weight, greater military power in Asia than heretofore. So the relative balance between East and West is shifting, and it's shifting uh, towards Asia, once again, uh, driven primarily by the rise of China, also by economic growth in other parts of Asia. Uh, and this was happening before COVID. COVID-19 had uh, been happening for at least 20 or 30 years. Um, third, in recent years, we've seen a global backlash again against what uh, some have called hyper-globalization, the idea of uh, opening up uh, the world to market forces as rapidly as possible. And we see this in lots of different ways. Uh, I think this uh, the British decision to leave the European Union was part of that backlash. The trade wars uh, begun by the Trump administration are part of that backlash. The gradual decoupling of the US and Chinese economies that had already uh, begun. Uh, populist opposition to immigration uh, as well is a key element uh, to this uh, too. And it's not just people like Donald Trump. Uh, it's worth remembering uh, that in the United States in 2016, Bernie Sanders uh, did surprisingly well in our presidential contest, and he was advocating a similar retreat from sort of full economic integration uh, as well. It's also important to remember that this has a, an important social dimension. It's not just about economics. And again, this concern about immigration, about countries losing uh, their ways of life because of foreigners coming here. That was happening in lots of different places uh, around the world as well, and it was happening before COVID-19. Um, another trend uh, that was taking place before the pandemic was increased in thor authoritarianism. Uh, there had been a period back in the unipolar moment when everyone sort of thought that the world was gradually going to converge on sort of Western style liberal democratic capitalism. Um, this did not take place. Uh, instead, we've actually seen a movement back in the other direction. So according to the research organization Freedom House, uh, 2019 was the 13th consecutive year in which the overall level of global freedom declined. We've seen illiberal trends in places like Poland, Hungary, Russia, Brazil, Turkey, and we've seen a centralization of power under Xi Jinping, uh, strengthening the control of the Communist Party in China as well, as opposed to moving in a more open and liberal direction, as many people had predicted 25 years or so. So the bottom line here is even before COVID-19 began, the world was becoming less open, less free, and to some degree less dominated by the Western powers, and in particular, the United States.
So what are the immediate effects of COVID-19? Well, these we're all pretty familiar with, unfortunately. Uh, we now have uh, about 10 million confirmed cases worldwide. And of course, that number is only going to go up. Uh, that probably undercounts the number of people who have been infected, but we know about 10 million confirmed cases. <clears throat> we have about a half a million confirmed deaths. And again, that number is going to go up uh, substantially as well in the months ahead. Uh, according to the IMF, the world economy is going to contract by at least 5% in 2020. Uh, I might add that that number keeps going up, right? They were estimating about a 3% contraction only a couple of months ago uh, as well. Um, according to the International Labor Organization, nearly half of the global workforce is at risk of having its livelihoods destroyed as a result of this. Um, we're also seeing debt levels soaring in many countries around the world, both developed and developing countries. Uh, and I think there's a growing consensus that a rapid economic recovery, what some people call uh, a V-shaped recovery, is very unlikely uh, absent a vaccine or a treatment that's uh, rapidly available. Now, the only other point I would add here is the effects of this are obviously bad for everyone, uh, but it's going to be, I think, particularly adverse in uh, emerging markets and developing economies simply because they don't have the healthcare institutions in place. They don't have the same uh, economic reserves that they can throw at economic problems. And I'm, my guess is also that the economic recovery is going to be slower in many of those places as well once it gets started. So let me talk a little bit about what the effects of COVID-19 are going to be uh, going forward. Um, COVID-19 revealed yet another risk to sort of fully integrated uh, supply chains. Uh, previously, it was something like Brexit, which would, was threatening supply chains between Great Britain and the European Union. Um, but also the China-US trade war was suddenly showing that politics could interfere with fully integrated supply chains, fully integrated markets. Well, COVID-19 is yet another uh, risk here, uh, showing that when you're uh, incredibly tied for reasons of economic efficiency to single suppliers, uh, then you're more vulnerable to unexpected changes. The result of that, of course, is that both states and individual firms are diversifying their suppliers, increasing their stockpiles, and bringing more production back home. Uh, it may be less efficient economically, but it may be more robust to changes. Um, and I quote here William Booter, of, uh, formerly of Citigroup, uh, who I think wrote this in the Financial Times a few weeks ago. That just he was quoting me. Ah, uh, really? Uh, good for you, Andrew. Uh, just in time economics will give way to just in case economics with multiple supply chains to ensure continuity in another crisis. Um, of course, COVID-19 also affects the other part of having an open world, which is the relative freedom to travel uh, for people to migrate to other countries or simply to engage in business and to move around. Uh, foreign travel has been severely restricted during the pandemic for all the uh, obvious reasons. And I think it's safe to say it's going to only open up uh, slowly and somewhat erratically as the virus waxes and wanes in different parts uh, of the world. It's worth noting, for example, that I can't come to the, Euro or to, uh, the European Union right now because I'm from the United States and where coronavirus cases are spiking. So Europe is uh, barring uh, tourism uh, from the United States right now. And I think we're gonna see that kind of thing continuing for quite some time. Um, there's another result to this, though, which is that, uh, and we've seen evidence of it already, is the fear of future infections, uh, either uh, the reintroduction of COVID or future pandemics, is likely to strengthen a sense of xenophobia, even racism. Uh, states are likely to maintain new barriers to travel and migration after the pandemic is over. And I think we're going to see that online meetings like this one are going to replace not all business travel, uh, but some business travel going forward. Bottom line here is it's going to be a less open world. And because I believe that uh, openness is actually a source of economic efficiency and greater productivity, it also means we're going to be living in a somewhat less productive world economy. 
um, not in every sector, obviously, but the future rate of economic growth in the world is likely to be lower than it would have been had this never occurred. It's also going to be a world that is less free. Again, this is a trend taking place before COVID, but COVID will accelerate and intensify it. It's worth remembering that in, an, in any kind of national emergency, governments tend to put limits on personal freedoms and civil liberties. You know, think of what happens to, uh, to us in a war, right? Governments impose censorship, they mobilize the economy, they often take over more control of the economy, they raise taxes. So governments tend to do a lot more uh, to regulate what their uh, citizens are doing in any kind of an emergency. Well, that's exactly what we're seeing. Of course, COVID-19 has led to lockdowns, uh, increased surveillance, mandatory testing, increasing tracking and tracing of individuals. And this is happening in democracies and non-democracies uh, alike. Uh, this is a universal response to an emergency and the point is that most of those or many of those restrictions may not be fully unwound even after the pandemic uh, is over. I, in some countries, leaders have uh, taken upon themselves emergency powers and they may not want to give all those emergency powers back even when the immediate danger of disease has gone. Um, also, it's worth noting that thus far, neither dictatorships nor democracies seem to have responded better on average. Uh, the record is rather mixed for both types of governments. Neither uh, form of government can really claim superiority yet. So we've had some authoritarian governments like Vietnam, and I think after uh, the, the pandemic uh, was understood, uh, China, that have actually responded relatively well. We've had some other authoritarian governments uh, like Russia that have responded quite badly. Uh, similarly, some democracies, New Zealand, uh, Germany, South Korea, Japan, have handled it pretty well. Other democracies, the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, Brazil, have done quite poorly. So there doesn't seem to be either uh, type of government that is universally or consistently done better in responding to something like this. Um, the bottom line here, though, is although some restrictions on individual activity are bound to be lifted uh, after the pandemic is over, others are likely to remain in place. And some of these may not have that much to do with public health per se, uh, especially in authoritarian countries where this has been an opportunity to gain somewhat greater control. Uh, for example, I can easily imagine uh, foreign governments uh, requiring travelers uh, to load uh, an app, a tracing app, onto their cell phones when they enter the country. Uh, that this would simply be a universal requirement justified, of course, by the need to be able to track a, a disease if it's, uh, if it's underway, but also, of course, very useful for monitoring who you're talking to, who you're meeting, where you're going, what you're doing. Uh, what, I, again, I'm suggesting is that the various restrictions that have been placed, uh, you know, put in place in order to deal with the pandemic uh, aren't likely to all disappear uh, once this is over with. And that means we are headed into a less free world. Now, what does all this mean for, um, you know, sort of the overall world order we're likely uh, to be living in? Well, first of all, Nationalism and great power competition were increasing before the pandemic. Uh, a number of governments around the world uh, were starting to see each other very much as serious rivals. I'll say a bit more about that in a second. Uh, but also, I think nationalism had reemerged in a big way as a driving force of politics. Uh, true within the European Union, true in India, definitely true in China. And it's always been a pretty profound uh, set of beliefs here in the United States as well. Um, that was underway again before COVID-19. What you see in response to COVID-19 is not a lot of uh, hand-holding across national borders, but rather states going it alone in response to the pandemic. Uh, here in the United States, you know, we cut off funding to the World Health Organization as part of an effort to try and blame them for the problem. 
Uh, Russia, China, the United States, and India have all declined to contribute to the European Union's vaccine research fund. And indeed, we've seen a whole set of countries trying to protect the vaccine research efforts that are going on within their own borders. They want to make sure that if a successful vaccine is developed inside their own country, um, that they have control over it at first. It's available for their citizens first and foremost. Uh, of course, uh, some governments, uh, most notably my own, have also tried to shift the blame onto others, uh, as when President Trump likes to blame this on the Wuhan virus or calling it, uh, you know, blaming it all on, on China as opposed to taking responsibility uh, himself. Um, so again, we're seeing um, not uh, a sort of an emergence of a great deal of global cooperation here. We're seeing, again, a, a very much a, a every country for itself approach. There is one exception to that. Uh, I think the European Union and its efforts to create a recovery fund have gone further than I would have expected uh, beforehand, uh, although it's not a, a done deal yet. But that might be one exception. Um, the other obvious exception is there has been uh, a considerable amount of transnational scientific cooperation, the scientific community exchanging information about the virus as part of a more collective effort. That has not been 100% perfect. There have been some limits and restrictions there as well. But that's a, those are the two main exceptions I see to what has otherwise been an every country for itself uh, response to the emergency. And meanwhile, while all of that is taking place, we still have conflicts continuing in lots of places around the world, Syria, Afghanistan, Yemen, uh, Ukraine, and some others, including a simmering border dispute now between India and China. So let me now turn to uh, where I think the future, what the future global order uh, looks like here. Uh, I think the post-pandemic world, when this is behind us, is going to be defined primarily by an intense rivalry between the United States and China, especially in Asia. Uh, and this is going to take place for several reasons. Uh, these will be the two most powerful countries in the world for quite some time to come. And the two most powerful countries uh, always eye each other warily uh, because each is the other's greatest potential threat and neither can be 100% certain what the other might do if pressed or if challenged. Um, so we're going to be uh, competing with China for a variety of reasons. Um, that's going to be intensified by uh, essentially a clash of national strategies. Um, the Chinese over time are going to want to try and push the United States out of Asia, uh, get its, uh, our Asian allies to distance themselves from the United States. And this just makes sense. Uh, no major power would want the other major power to have close alliances and military forces all around its borders. So you can expect China to try and push the United States out of Asia. Of course, the United States is not going to want that to happen, is not going to want to be pushed out. We are going to want to try and maintain those alliance relations because we would like China to have to worry more about its immediate surroundings, about its immediate neighborhood, so that it can't more easily project power and influence into other parts of the world, including, one could imagine, into the Western Hemisphere, where the United States has dominated uh, for a long time. What I'm suggesting here is both because they're the two largest countries in the world, but also because they have somewhat different objectives when it comes to Asia, uh, there's going to be a very serious competition between uh, the United States and China. Now, China's rise and its increasing assertiveness is also alarming a number of countries uh, in Asia, from India all the way around to Japan. And that's making those countries more interested in cooperating with each other, but also in maintaining close security ties with the United States. So you could argue that the ingredients for a balancing coalition are, are readily available. Um, I would just caution that maintaining that coalition, I think it's possible, but it's not going to be easy. Uh, the distances involved are enormous. Uh, if you consider uh, from India down to Australia and all the way up uh, to Japan, 
Uh, it's not like Europe where NATO is in a relatively uh, compact uh, region. Uh, second, uh, these countries all have extensive economic ties with China, and they don't want to jeopardize those ties uh, while maintaining close relations with the United States. So there's some trade-offs for them uh, there. Uh, and then finally, some of these countries don't get along particularly well themselves. Uh, think of South Korea and Japan. Uh, what I'm suggesting here is, although there are ingredients for a balancing coalition designed to uh, limit Chinese influence in Asia, Holding that coalition together is not going to be easy, and it's going to require a lot of sophisticated leadership, it seems to me, by the United States. I don't think that kind of leadership has been available in the last few years, uh, and I hope the next administration, whoever the president turns out to be, devotes a lot more attention to that particular problem. Bottom line here is, again, the post-pandemic world is going to be defined primarily by a rivalry between the United States and China. And a lot of that is going to be a competition for influence in Asia. Now, within this situation, the United States, I think, still has many advantages. Uh, we often tend to uh, see America's problems, assume there's nothing that can be done about them. But I do think COVID-19 has hurt because it has tarnished the American image, uh, tarnished our reputation for competence. Uh, other states are more willing to follow America's lead when they think we know what we're doing. And the poor American response to the pandemic has made it, it, made it look like we really didn't. Uh, that's going to make other states more inclined to keep their own counsel, less inclined to, to follow American guidance. And my hope as an American is that we're able to sort of reverse course, uh, and rebuild our image relatively quickly uh, and be able to you know, exert the kind of influence we ought to be uh, exerting around the world. Uh, as for the European Union, I think the European Union will continue to be preoccupied with a whole series of internal issues. Uh, they're going to face uh, the same sets of economic challenges um, that the rest of the world faces after the pandemic is over. And it's been a tough you know, 15 years or so now for Europe uh, economically uh, as well. Um, so I guess I'd argue that the European Union and Europe's individual members are going to be a preoccupied preoccupied with internal issues, uh, to some degree punching below their weight. Um, but I would add one final caution. Uh, Europe is not going to be able to remain neutral between the United States and China uh, and sort of sit that one out and at the same time continue to rely very heavily on American security protection through NATO. Uh, I am not saying that the, the Europeans should line up with us uh, against China, but the point is it's gonna be impossible to sit this out and at the same time uh, get the Americans to continue to devote resources to protecting Europe. So it seems to me Europe is gonna face a sort of fundamental choice at some point in the relatively near future. Um, and in my view, the principal way of holding the transatlantic relationship together will be essentially a bargain where the United States agrees to remain committed to European security, although probably uh, with less effort than in the past. And most of Europe agrees to cooperate with the United States in various ways uh, to limit Chinese power and influence. Can I just ask you, who is the U.S. protecting Europe against? Um, that's the, the whole problem, uh, of course. I mean, we think we're protecting it now uh, against Russia as we were previously protecting it against, um, uh, against the Soviet Union. But in my view, Russia simply does not pose the kind of existential threat to European security. Uh, and Europe has uh, sufficient wherewithal to deal with that if it's able to organize and mobilize the resources available. Uh, Europe's economy is much larger than Russia's, which is actually smaller than Italy's. Um, and NATO's European members, not counting the United States, NATO's European members spend three to four times what Russia spends on defense every year. Um, so in my view, yes, as of today, Russia is militarily stronger, but only because the Europeans haven't spent their money very wisely and have tended to see the United States as the first responder uh, whenever the temperature, uh, temperature goes up. Um, I think looking forward, we're going to have to expect Europe to do more uh, to protect itself. 
Uh, and the United States will want to be focusing most of its effort in Asia. But when it comes to things like trade, investment, uh, you know, high technology exchanges, things like that, I think Washington is going to expect Brussels and most of the capital cities in Europe uh, to line up on uh, America's side rather than on Beijing's. Uh, Russia, needless to say, is going to continue to decline uh, relative to other powers. Uh, no uh, indication that they're about to turn the corner and have a period of uh, robust economic growth. And I think as uh, fossil fuels become increasingly uh, less uh, used less for climate change reasons, uh, that's going to be a long-term drain on Russia as well. Um, overall, however, power and influence will continue to shift uh, in the direction of Asia, just as it was before the pandemic. Again, I don't want to suggest that suddenly Asia is more powerful uh, than the West, but the balance between East and West has shifted in the direction uh, of Asia. Now, I've been painting a picture of a relatively uh, you know, competitive uh, world here, a world uh, where uh, the major powers are going to be eyeing each other, uh, you know, warily, and especially the United States and China are going to see each other as very serious rivals. Uh, but even so, there are a number of areas where the major powers must continue to cooperate, where there are benefits from uh, keeping the competition within limits or walling off some areas uh, where we have to work together. Uh, the first and most obvious one, of course, is ending the current pandemic and then taking steps to prevent uh, future ones. Um, so in fact, I think the tendency of countries to be disinclined to cooperate to address this, the tendency to try and blame others for the pandemic is not helpful. Uh, and we should be doing everything we can uh, to work with other countries, to exchange scientific information, to make uh, treatments or vaccine once it's developed uh, available. This is in everyone's interest to have this particular danger put behind us. Uh, and at the same time, I think we've now learned, given the consequences of this, uh, that not having a better international arrangements for detecting and communicating and responding to an event like this just leaves us vulnerable. Um, it's also worth noting that uh, COVID-19 is not the first one of these that has happened. We've had Ebola, we've had SARS, we've had Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, we've had uh, HIV AIDS. So this is the latest in a series of trans species viruses that have uh, hit uh, humans in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and that means there's every reason to expect something like this to happen in the future. Uh, we obviously have uh, incentives uh, to be better prepared the next time around. Um, the second and obvious uh, area where uh, global cooperation is necessary is climate change. Uh, this is a problem that no single country can solve unilaterally, and we are not going to get any kind of reasonable response if we don't have cooperation under the major, uh, among the major greenhouse gas producers. So regardless of what happens uh, to Sino-American relations, working together to try and address that problem, I think, is absolutely uh, essential. A third area is nuclear security. Uh, all of the major powers have incentives uh, to uh, limit the spread of nuclear weapons to other countries and to improve the security over existing nuclear arsenals so that they can't be stolen, so that they can't be used in un any kind of unauthorized fashion. Uh, this was a, an item that uh, President Obama pushed very hard and with some success during his presidency. And I hope the next American president uh, goes back to that agenda. Uh, again, it's one where our interests align pretty closely with countries like China or Russia or elsewhere. So we should be able to cooperate regardless of what the overall state of the relationship is. Um, number four, uh, you know, the retreat from hyper-globalization, the emergence of China as a major economic actor, the backlash uh, that we've seen in a number of countries against this all suggests that we need to develop uh, some new rules for global trade and investment. Uh, there's lots of criticism now about the World Trade Organization. Uh, I think it is definitely in need of reform and revision, if not 
uh, abandonment. But the point is, you can't have a productive and integrated world economy without a set of guidelines and set of rules uh, for, for governing this. And that's, again, an area where the United States, China, and lots of other countries actually have a shared interest in working out what those rules uh, might be. Oh, come on, that's I, high in the sky. Look at what's happening in the OECD at the moment. You can't even agree with the fangs, the gaff attacks. I, I agree completely. Uh, and that I think is very, uh, it's very disturbing. Uh, but again, if I were asking, you know, places where the major powers should be cooperating, uh, that would be one of them. Uh, and I'd say the same thing about cyberspace, right, where uh, developing a general set of norms, code of conduct, understandings of what sorts of activities are going to be permissible and what sorts of activities are not is something we should be working on. I don't think it's going to be easy to reach that uh, level of agreement. And there's going to be some areas where I think it's impossible. Uh, you know, we're not going to be able to ban, for example, espionage uh, taking place uh, by governments uh, using the Internet to try and hack into uh, their rivals' uh, systems in various ways. But there may be other ways where we can try and keep this uh, within boundaries and preserve some of the benefits. I think that's going to be particularly difficult vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, uh, and in part because you're starting already to see a, almost a fragmentation of you know, cyberspace between uh, the sort of Chinese-led, much more regulated, independent, uh, great firewall of China approach and what has been the approach elsewhere in the world to try and keep uh, this as open as possible. Uh, but that's, again, to me, another um, another area uh, where there ought to be, you know, conversations to see if we can have at least some uh, general ground rules as well. Uh, my bottom line here is that uh, preserving the areas where cooperation is still possible, the joint gains, the mutual benefits that we all get in an era of rising competition is actually going to be the major geopolitical challenge in a post-COVID world. Um, we're obviously going to be rivals with China. We're going to compete with them in a variety of ways, uh, uh, certainly in the military sphere. But whether or not while that is happening, we can still wall off those areas where our interests overlap and make progress on those areas is going to be the real uh, foreign policy challenge. And I would just remind everybody that uh, back at the height of the Cold War in the 1960s, when the Vietnam War was raging, when the Soviet Union was helping North Vietnam, uh, etc., the United States and the Soviet Union jointly sponsored the Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, to limit the spread of nuclear weapons, because that was one issue where their interests were largely uh, aligned. Um, and we have to look, it seems to me, in the uh, years ahead for the areas where the great powers all do have an interest in cooperating, even though I think much of the uh, nature of world politics will be highly competitive. Uh, so to, to end this, I just ended by quoting the uh, classic American movie all about Eve. Uh, Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night or more precisely, a bumpy decade or more. Let me stop there and uh, ask Andrew if he has any questions he wants to ask me. Yeah, I have. I have lots of questions. I have lots of questions. I mean, one one thing you you haven't discussed obviously is wokeism uh, and the changes that that is imposing on the American elite. I would really like you also to talk about your critique of the blob, and I would love you to say a few words on what you perceive that a Biden presidency might actually look like, because you've certainly been quoted on it, even if you haven't written on it. <laughs> so those would be my three issues, wokeism, uh, the blob, the Biden presidency. So uh, with the, the first one, wokeism, so I mean, more broadly, I mean, the, the most immediate example here is the Black Lives Matter movement and the demonstrations we've seen in the United States over the last few weeks. Uh, a sort You've of just taken out your competing institution, the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton. Uh, it's just uh, and, and my former employer, because I began my my career teaching there. Um, it, it has uh, not taken out the institution. Uh, his name has simply been removed uh, from it. Um, I think this is a really interesting uh, problem, I guess. I think it's quite clear here in the United States that um, uh, 
what you would call the problem of systemic racism has bubbled to the top now. And far more people, uh, both uh, people of color, but also white Americans, I think are recognizing that this is a deeper problem than they've been willing to acknowledge. Um, and not surprisingly, you're getting, um, I think, both, in my view, uh, completely appropriate responses, uh, you know, taking down the statues of Confederate generals or renaming American military bases. Uh, makes perfect sense to me, given that the people they were named after actually fought against uh, the Union uh, back in, in the Civil War. It's sort of odd to have those uh, commanders be memorialized at a U.S. military base uh, today. Where I think uh, we're in somewhat greater danger is whether or not this becomes uh, a movement that uh, you know goes too far. Um, I am a, m more of a Burkean, I guess, in my own uh, outlook. I am not a big fan of revolutions uh, because revolutions often have vast unintended consequences. And once you sort of tear up all the institutions of a society, you're not quite sure what they're going to uh, replace them with. I am hopeful that this period um, ignites a process of, you know, constructive democratic reform, um, because a, a lot of issues within our own society, I think, do need to be addressed, whether it's the nature of the Electoral College, uh, the fact that we're a, a proud democracy in which many people either don't bother to vote or can't vote easily. Uh, all of these things are areas that we ought to be, uh, be working on. And that kind of gets me to my uh, second point, uh, the blob. Um, I mean, one of my critiques of the blob is that it uh, uh, was a sort of uh, a consensus view that saw the United States as the indispensable power, to use Madeleine Albright's uh, famous uh, phrase, but also uh, the view that our country had uh, sort of figured out the perfect formula for how you run a modern society. And all we had to do was make every other country around the world more and more like us, and then everything would be fine. Uh, this sounds kind of fanciful, but this was genuinely believed if you go back to the 1990s and look at what people uh, wrote and thought. Uh, you know, people like Tom Friedman uh, in his book, Lexus and the Olive Tree, were touting American capitalism as the real model uh, for, for the world. Um, and they thought it would be very easy to spread this model uh, all over the world, that everybody around the world really couldn't wait to become more like the United States of America. I think we've seen over the past 15 or 20 years that that didn't work. Uh, some countries had no interest in becoming like uh, the United States. And in other places where we tried to uh, convert other countries, what we got was a failed state instead, whether it was Iraq or Libya or Afghanistan uh, or, or wherever. Uh, yet that consensus view uh, remained deeply uh, hardwired into much of the foreign policy world uh, here in Washington. And interestingly enough, you know, Donald Trump ran against that in 2016. He was extremely critical of the foreign policy establishment. And the foreign policy establishment, both Democrats and Republicans alike, was very worried about Trump. You might Andrew, that back in 2016, there were open letters signed by over 100 former Republican foreign policy experts, really bold-faced names, uh, denouncing Trump's candidacy and declaring him to be unfit for office. And again, these were Republicans, uh, not Democrats. What I find striking is that although Trump has in many ways torn up the rule book in, in his activities as president, including his handling of foreign policy, the way he comes about it, he actually hasn't changed American foreign policy as much as you might uh, think. The establishment hasn't controlled him completely, but has uh, exerted a lot of influence to restrain him. The United States is still in NATO, uh, despite all of his criticisms. We are still engaged in all our alliances uh, in Asia. Um, we are still uh, spending enormous amounts on our military to maintain a position of military primacy. He has doubled down on all of our al alliances in the Middle East, uh, sort of never criticizes uh, them. We are still hostile to Iran, and we were before that uh, as well. So on issue after issue after issue, um, he has um, behaved very differently 
uh, but ultimately has not changed things as much as, as you might think. Um, now, that brings me to uh, uh, the Biden uh, presidency. I think what you'll see uh, is, first of all, most people that uh, Biden appoints will be familiar figures from the Obama administration. It will be the Democratic foreign policy establishment. And to some degree, they're going to try to go back to um, you know, roll the clock back to 2016 to sort of the relations the United States had. You'll see a reaffirmation of the commitment to NATO. Uh, you'll see, um, you know, uh, some uh, commitment to um, our uh, a greater uh, response or greater confrontation uh, towards China. But I don't think they're going to be able to return things all the way back to where uh, things were. And it gets back to the point about wokeness. Um, the, the ground has shifted, I think, politically in the United States. Uh, younger Americans are not as interested in trying to run the world. Uh, some of those sentiments are being expressed uh, in elections now, uh, where the more progressive wing of the Democratic Party are winning congressional seats. The point here being the Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez victory, despite the huge amounts of money that the Republican establishment on Wall Street was pouring in. That, that's right. And also the defeat of uh, Elliot Engel, a 30 year member of, of Congress and uh, chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee as well uh, by a young progressive, uh, you know, quite uh, quite in the AOC uh, mold. But the other part uh, that is going to play into this is uh, the impact of COVID-19 itself. Right. Um, and the impact of the Black Lives Matter movement and the general sense that there is an enormous amount of work that has to be done here in the United States. So like most other governments around the world, the United States is piling up enormous amounts of debt uh, right now. And we're doing that in order to keep the economy going while we get through uh, the pandemic. Uh, this means that resources are going to be hard to come by. Uh, once the pandemic is uh, is gone, you're not going to be able to get people to spend the kinds of money on the military that they have in the past. We're not going to see radical disarmament. We're not going to cut the defense budget by 50 percent or anything like that. But Americans are going to care about having health care. They're going to care about being able to send their kids to school. They're not going to care very much about which corrupt Afghan politician is governing in Kabul. Right. When uh, the Pentagon shows up and wants uh, another 50 F-35s, that's going to be a tougher sell than it was before. I, again, I don't want to overstate this. This doesn't mean the United States is going to withdraw from the entire world or disarm or anything like that. But you're going to see, I think, much greater attention on issues closer to home and much less desire to try and run the whole world the way we did from roughly 1992 to roughly uh, 2016 or maybe uh, 2020. Last point. Final point on that. Can I ask, just ask you, um, we've talked about wokeness and black lives, but of course the fastest growing ethnic group is Hispanics. And his, what is the interest of Hispanics when it comes to foreign policy? Where are their interests? Um, listen, I don't know a great deal about it. I've never you know, deeply studied it. They have been uh, traditionally organized in some cases. I mean, the Cuban-American population cared a lot about Cuba uh, and tended to be actually more politically conservative. Um, they, the Hispanic population has not generally engaged a lot on foreign policy issues. That may well change. Uh, I think they have been more uh, concerned uh, with sort of domestic issues and making it here in the United States. Um, but I, so I can't really say how the rising population is going to affect foreign policy, except to say it's likely to diminish its importance or its salience uh, in, in a number of, of ways. I just wanted to add one other point is that um, I think what this all means is the United States is going to be more selective in its international engagements. It will not uh, retreat to Fortress America, but it's going to have to make some choices. My own view, both my recommendation and my prediction, is that you'll see a lot more uh, focus on Asia, uh, much less focus on the Middle East, uh, much less focus on Europe uh, over time. I think that trend was, you could see that trend uh, pre-COVID, but I think uh, that trend will be intensified and accelerated uh, by what's happened in the last year. One final question, closer to home, the US-UK relationship. 
the possibility of a free trade area. What kind of salience does the UK relationship have remaining in Washington? Is there such a thing as a special relationship or is it entirely dead? Um, I don't think it's entirely dead uh, for both historical reasons. I think there are, you know, again, transnational connections of a variety of sorts, uh, still um, members of the American elite who, uh, you know, uh, appreciate and respect the advice they get from their British counterparts and uh, feel like there is a, a genuine sort of meeting of minds on some issues there. That said, uh, you know, uh, I come from a relatively ruthless country uh, as well, and uh, Great Britain is not going to get any special deals from the United States as a result of the special relationship. Uh, I know your prime minister has often talked about how he's going to get a great trade deal from his good friend Donald Trump. Uh, I think that's over-optimistic. Uh, if you just look at the relative size of the two economies, the United States will get the better of that particular agreement because access to our market is more important for you than uh, access to your market is for us. Um, so there is something of the special relationship left, uh, but it's not what it was, uh, say, in the 1950s. And I would not be overconfident about the uh, nature of a trade deal that we negotiate bilaterally. You would have you would have been better off to be part of uh, the European Union, uh, a economic block roughly the size of ours uh, when you come to Washington to strike a trade deal. And we would have been bailing out Italy and Greece until the sands of time have run out. That, that as that's a distinct possibility. So it, you can make an argument that on net you'd be better off where you are. But in terms of bilateral trade negotiations with the United States, it's better to be part of a big group than to be by oneself. Which of course is why Donald Trump doesn't like the European Union and why he likes bilateral trade deals. Because if you're a 19 or 20 trillion dollar economy and you're dealing with a much smaller economy, you have a lot more leverage. Well, he should give us a sweetheart deal so that he can sell the idea of bilateral deals to other countries and give them a much tougher deal. And I <laughs> thank you, Steve. That was great. Stephen Walt from Harvard, many, many thanks. And thank you My all. Pleasure. Nice talking with you, Andrew, as always.